name is Paul Hellyer, and I am a former Minister of National Defence for Canada. This disturbing message is for the several million Americans and others who are kind enough to listen to the 22-minute presentation at the Citizens Disclosure Hearing in Washington in May 2013, and for anyone else who cares deeply about the future of their country and the planet Earth. The U.S. is in grave danger. Strangely, the peril is not from foreign enemies, but from enemies within. So I beg you to listen to a summary of the major problems, followed by some suggestions as to how the U.S. might be recaptured by loyal Americans to the enormous relief of friends who have been watching helplessly from the sidelines. The stakes couldn't be higher. So I spent the 15 months following the Washington hearing feverishly writing a new book, incorporating what I think every American has the right to know and must know to end the incredible naivety observed at the citizens' hearing. The name of the book is The Money Mafia, A World in Crisis. Most of my friends, both American and Canadian, tend to agree that the world is in a state of crisis. But very few are aware that the problems are not natural phenomena. They have been engineered by a very tiny elite group of rich, ruthless and power-hungry people who have been deliberately keeping the majority of decent, hard-working taxpayers totally in the dark. The Iron Veil of Secrecy is now nearing the end of its seventh decade. When World War II ended, little attention was given to Operation Paperclip, under which hundreds of Nazi scientists were brought to the U.S., given new identities, and then appointed to important jobs in the military and elsewhere. Some of them would have been aware of UFOs of the ET presence from their experience in working with them in the 1930s. The American military began to take the subject more seriously after retrieving one of the vehicles that crashed near Roswell, New Mexico, on July 4th, 1947, and decided to back-engineer its technology, which was light years more advanced than anything that we had known. On Tuesday, July the 8th, 1947, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, Roswell Air Field Commanding Officer Colonel William Blanchard announced in a press release the recovery of a flying disc. That was the truth. Later that same day, at approximately 4.30 p.m. Central Time, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, Commander of the 8th Air Force and Blanchard's Supervising Officer, presented to the press an alternative story. He claimed the Army had recovered a Rowan target device suspended by a neoprene balloon. That was a lie. In fact, it was the cornerstone lie of what was to become a cult of lying and disinformation that is still United States policy today, 68 years later. In my brief address to the Citizens' Disclosure Hearing, I said that the United States and much of the Western world is ultimately controlled by an unelected, unaccountable cabal. Its apex is the banking and financial cartel, followed by the oil cartel, the CEOs of the largest and most powerful transnational corporations, major intelligence agencies, including the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA, and a major slice of the U.S. military. Their collective power and influence is incalculable. And it is their plan for the U.S. and the rest of us that is so alarming. Their plan is an empire greater in size and power than any empire before it. 
They call this the New World Order, which, ironically, is the same name Hitler used for the smaller empire he imagined. One sure thing, the New World Order will end all pretense of government of, by, and for the people. It will be a dictatorship of, by, and for a small minority of the rich and privileged elite. Much of its power lies in the privately owned banking system. Why monarchs and politicians allowed a private cartel to become the monopoly supplier of new money, we will never know. But this power is almost absolute and can determine the fate of nations and their people. A system where nearly all money is created as debt, a debt that has to be repaid with interest, but where no one creates any money with which to pay the interest, is a dead end that leaves debtors with no alternative but to borrow the money to pay the interest and go deeper and deeper into debt. It's so wildly absurd that a grade 10 student would only need a few minutes to recognize it as one giant Ponzi scheme. Banks can invest $5 million and leverage it to create $100 million in loans that have to be repaid with interest. In effect, they skim 95% off the top of every loan. That is the reason I call them the money mafia. Monetary reform is the most urgent of all essential reforms, and my book contains a specific formula that the brave Occupy Wall Street protesters could have used to advantage when asked, but what do you suggest? What they lacked was the answer to that question. If about 99% of the population don't understand a deception that has been responsible for the Great Depression of the 1930s, the terrible recessions of 1981-82, 1991 and the Great Recession of the 21st century, it's not too difficult to understand why there are so many skeptics about UFOs and their occupants, even though several species have been visiting planet Earth for thousands of years. The crashes near Roswell, New Mexico, that I referred to earlier, were, in a sense, watershed events. In Canada, Wilbert Smith, a senior officer in our Federal Department of Transport, of which uh, I later became minister, wrote a top secret memorandum to his boss based on information he had received during a visit to our embassy in Washington. The memo, dated November 21st, 1950, read in part as follows. A. The matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States, reading higher even than the H-bomb. B, flying saucers exist. C, their modus operandi is unknown, but concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. D, the entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. A control group of 12 senior civilian scientists and military officers was established by President Truman. They were known as the Majestic 12, or MJ-12, which issued a memorandum that included how to respond to UFO sightings by saying that they were natural phenomena, such as plasma, or swamp gas, or that the observer might have been imbibing too much Jack Daniels bourbon. Nothing could be further from the truth. Under the Eisenhower administration, much of the physical engineering was transferred to underground facilities in Nevada and Arizona. Meanwhile, much of the control was transferred to civilian agencies in order to create plausible deniability as to its existence. 
When President Eisenhower wanted to take a look at the restricted areas, he was denied access. It was only when he threatened to send in the First Army that it was agreed that he could send three confidants to look at the secret areas, 51 and S4. They reported that the Roswell vehicle was indeed being back-engineered by United States forces. President Eisenhower was so distressed by the situation that he included in his farewell address to the nation that his fellow Americans should beware of the military industrial complex, which, according to one witness, was his way of saying that the ET file had fallen into the wrong hands. Indeed it had. It was under the control of the military industrial complex, otherwise known as the financial, intelligence, and military wing of the all-pervasive cabal, which has seized control of the United States and much of the balance of the world. Beginning with Eisenhower, not one of the presidents of the United States has been given completely honest advice by his civil, military, and intelligence advisors, nor fully briefed on the ET presence and technology. The military-industrial complex adopted a strategy of perpetual warfare to enhance its own power and profit. It is inconceivable that this plan was discussed and approved in advance by any American president. Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist who came to the U.S. at the end of World War II, told my friend Dr. Carol Rosen, who worked with him, that they, the military industrial complex, in order to maintain perpetual war, had to have an enemy. First, it will be the communists, he said. Then it will be the terrorists. And finally, it will be the ETs. So far, the plan has been unfolding exactly as forecast. The cabal, sometimes referred to as the shadow government, has been in control. When Sarah McClendon, veteran White House reporter, asked President Bill Clinton why he didn't do something about UFO disclosure, Clinton replied, and I quote, Sarah, there's a government inside the government, and I don't control it, end of quote. Imagine the President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces isn't cleared to know what his troops are doing. Well, with the end of the Cold War, the Pentagon wrote a new defense plan, popularly known as a project for the new American century. It was very far-reaching and involved conquest of much of the world by financial or military means, whichever was easiest. The document, which very few people were aware of, admitted that it was so far-reaching that it might be too much for Americans to swallow in the absence of some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well. Lady Luck appeared to be on their side in the form of September the 11th, 2001. Amateur foreign pilots trained in the U.S. allegedly hijacked planes and flew them into the sides of the World Trade Towers 1 and 2, and then into the Pentagon. Later in the day, the buildings collapsed. President Bush declared war on the terrorists and invoked the provisions in the North Atlantic Treaty under which an attack on any one country is considered to be an attack on all. The reaction was unprecedented since the outbreak of World War II and the later attack on Pearl Harbor. The English-speaking world in particular was incensed, and a high percentage of Americans were prepared to nuke the perpetrators. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld soon announced that, quote, that means war against Iraq, end of quote, even though 
there was absolutely no evidence of Iraqi complicity, none whatsoever. Although most Muslims had been sympathetic to the U.S. in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, as soon as the bombs started dropping on Baghdad, moderate Muslims by the thousand were so outraged and overcome by hate that they opted for a terrorist response. From that day on, it would be difficult to find a terrorist who did not have made in the USA etched on his or her soul. Now, more than a decade later, the situation becomes even darker as the truth about 9-11 begins to emerge from the burial ground of a controlled press. We find that high officials in the George W. Bush administration knew of the attack weeks in advance and made no effort to prevent it. On the contrary, the evidence points to complicity when we find that not just two nor three buildings collapsed, nor four, nor five, nor six, but seven. Some, if not all, had been rigged for controlled demolition. But that isn't all. A new weapon of mass destruction was used that reduced the concrete and steel to dust before it reached the ground. If you have any doubts about this, get a copy of Dr. Judy Wood's book entitled, Where Did the Towers Go? Five hundred pages of meticulous evidence. The unfolding story reveals the greatest mass deception in history with the most universally negative consequences. Far more important than the long lineups for security checks at airports, we have been stripped of our civil rights one by one, including, I regret to say, habeas corpus, reversing 800 years of progress. Country was set against country, religion against religion, words like peace and negotiated settlement, which had been possibilities before 9-11, were lost in the jungle of lies. The cabal, also known as the military industrial complex, was not interested in a just settlement. It wanted perpetual war, and that was what its heinous deception achieved. It also robbed the once great United States of America of its last vestige of moral leadership. Worse, by invoking NATO, it transformed a defense alliance into a US-led task force. And by recruiting former countries from the Soviet Union, an obvious provocation to Russia, it has managed to create rumblings of a new Cold War. The danger lies in the fact that the new world order is not limited to old boundaries and concepts of empire, and we seem hell-bent toward a third world war. Horrible beyond human imagination. It must not be allowed to happen. Almost every president since Eisenhower has been under the control of the cabal, and President Obama regrettably has been no exception. Before he was sworn in as a new president, I saw a picture of his economic advisors. And I said, oh, oh, the same old gang who permitted the Bush recession. Nothing will change. Then when the president persuaded innocent allies to join in a second unwinnable war in Iraq, and a senior U.S. military commander confirmed that it would take several years to win, it was obvious that President Obama was playing the military-industrial alliance game and that it would be the only winner. Extreme Islam is an ideology and it can't be killed by smart bombs. Most ISIS recruits begin as young idealists who are repelled by the way the world is being run and are looking for a better way. 
any effective strategy must be to win their hearts and minds and not just to kill them and make them martyrs to a cause. Step number one is to convince President Obama that the policies of his predecessor benefit no one but the arms manufacturers. So all non-Muslim members of the coalition should withdraw from the war against the Islamic State and begin to reverse all of the wrongs committed by the West in recent years. Hate him or love him, President Obama is the only person in the world with the power to lead a penitent United States and its misled allies in the moral and spiritual revolution essential for a world of peace and justice where the human species has a fighting chance to survive. The transformation has to be reversible before the next U.S. presidential election, which could be the point of no return. Ultimately, the Muslims must be allowed to settle their own problems. Before 9-11, Iraq was a Sunni dictatorship that treated its Shia brothers and sisters badly. The U.S. deposed Saddam Hussein and established a new Shia majority that treated a Sunni minority unfairly. The seeds of further conflict were born. The Muslims must resolve their age-long differences as Christians and of different denominations have recently been able to do. Perhaps the United Nations might be invited by the Muslims to convene a meeting of both temporal and religious leaders in search of a better way of settling grievances and differences. Meanwhile, it's time that all the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, kissed and made up. I was in my 80s before I knew that Allah was my God. My guess is that the majority of Christians are equally ill-informed. And the Israelites should start treating Palestinians as the blood brothers that they really are, instead of as inferior beings. It is wise to remember that the original covenant with the Creator applied to all of Abraham's children, and not just to the favored few. The bottom line is that the use of drones, suicide bombs, and crushing military superiority on the part of Christians, Muslims, and Jews are all prohibited by their holy books. The next step is to persuade all the major religions to practice the one principle that they have in common, which is to treat others the way they would want to be treated if the roles were reversed. Universal practice of the golden rule would transform the world. I get hundreds of emails from decent Americans and like-minded individuals in a dozen countries who want nothing more than the end of militarism and a massive shift in priorities toward universal peace and justice. Quite a few are involved in small projects that are making a significant difference at the micro level. But most of them are realists and recognize that the cabal doesn't want peace and justice. It wants power, wealth, and empire. So what can an individual do in the face of unprecedented power and wealth? The cabal, headed by the banking cartel, has almost unlimited financial power. But we the people have the numbers and must combine our limited power to form a critical mass that can move mountains. There is no guaranteed formula, but an educated guess would be that if five million decent and determined Americans got a copy of The Money Mafia, A World in Crisis, read it carefully, and then actively supported the comprehensive action plan set out in it, a miracle could happen. Each one of the five million would have to write a personal letter to the president, their senator, and their congressperson demanding action forthwith in each of the critical areas in the same spirit of bipartisanship 
that would be expected in a war to save the world, which is exactly what is at stake. I am not going to repeat the list of essential reforms here, except for a few key items. The U.S. should play a leadership role in ending the private banker's monopoly to print money. Actually, it isn't really money, it's just credit created out of thin air, uh, a computer entry, and restore some of the power to the people that is rightfully theirs. President Obama can mint $2 trillion platinum coins to get the ball rolling, while legislation is prepared to take over the Fed and establish a 100% publicly owned central bank, a central bank of the United States. There cannot and will not be peace and justice on earth while the Fed continues to exist. Speaking of justice, if President Obama really wants a place in history as a friend of the 99% rather than the 1%, he can fast track the Trans-Pacific Partnership into oblivion. Even the name is a lie. There is no way it is a partnership. It should be called the Trans-Pacific Power Grab by a small elite group who want to feather their own nests at the expense of other people's rights to run their own affairs for their own benefit. So the choice is yours, Mr. President, to decide if it will be the people or the cabal. There must be full disclosure of what the cabal and the U.S. shadow government have been doing since World War II. To what extent has the extraterrestrial space and weapons technology been back engineered? And is it true, as the late Ben Rich, former CEO of Lockheed's uh, Skunk Works uh, said, and I quote, we, the US, now have the technology to take ET home, end of quote. The extent to which there has been collaboration between the cabal and the ETs. What species? What motives? Were there agreements signed? And if so, were the terms of the treaty or treaties lived up to? To hear the truth emerge after so many years of continual lies and darkness will require either that the National Security Act of 1947 be rescinded or suspended, with a general amnesty so that decent Americans can tell the truth without fear of retribution a kind of truth and reconciliation process will be required. Then there are the positive benefits that must be pursued. The president must issue an order that would release the secret patents on exotic energy and make them available to the world. The secret technology, in combination with the flexible financial system, will make it possible to convert from an oil economy to a clean economy in seven years. It will provide billions of new jobs worldwide and help close the ever-widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. Simultaneously, a project should be started to restore our oceans before the food chain has been permanently broken. In addition, worldwide programs of forest uh, preservation and reforestation should help provide the carbon sinks essential for greater stability in weather patterns. Speaking of changing weather patterns, full disclosure should give us a better idea of how much weather patterns have been altered by government tinkering. Due to restraints of time, space, and expertise, my book makes no mention of either chemtrails or the high-frequency active auroral research program known as HARP. But from what I have heard and read from credible informants, I would say that they are Satan's illegitimate Siamese twins of death and destruction. If so, they should be terminated at once and relegated to the netherworld from which they came. And before the people of the world become aware and launch a 10 or 20 trillion dollar class action suit against the United States Air Force, its contractors, 
associates, and suppliers. A visit to the battlefields of World Wars I and II in November of last year affected me profoundly. The slogans were everywhere, never again. We had seen the horror of man's inhumanity to man, which was sordid beyond belief. Yet as I reflected on the real world of today, I thought that the millions who gave their lives had died in vain. Even before the Second World War was over, a group of greedy, self-centered men were plotting the next round, and they had been working assiduously at their plan. The same symptoms of mass unemployment, poverty, and seeking military advantage have been replicated. But the next time, we would start off with weapons of mass destruction just in their infancy then. The next time, it is not just supremacy that is at stake, although there are some who think so. It is the survival of the human species that is at stake. God will not be mocked. We have been given the choice of making our planet uninhabitable, as we have been told some other species have done. Or we can move in the opposite direction of peace, love, justice, and cooperation for the betterment of all rich and poor alike. We have been given a few months, not years, to change course before it is too late. The choice is ours. We are the ones who are destined to write our own history.